God says that our future is threatened. Why? Because we turn away from him. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. This is Quick Study Television. It is a program taking you through the Bible in one year from Genesis to Revelation. And on today's program, we're going to study and discover something. First of all, God says our future is threatened because we've turned away from him. What does that mean? How does that mean? We'll talk about that and more coming up in just a moment. Corey is here to tell us what she's doing. Corey? Today we're going to be taking a look at the life and the job description of Jeremiah's right-hand man. Excellent. And Ryan is here with Cosmic Mysteries. Ryan? Well, you know, it was once believed that there were only 1,022 stars. Of course, today we know that the stars are innumerable. So how do astronomers possibly keep track of all of those? Very good. And you studied today. Mm -hmm. What did you f figure out? We're going to take a look at Jeremiah 16, some things we learn about that man. The book of Jeremiah names the prophet Jeremiah's right-hand man and scribe. He, his name is Baruch, and he comes from a noble family. Now, there are a few other names mentioned in cohesion with Baruch. A series of bully, which are small, ancient clay impressions of signet seals, began to appear on the antiquities market in the 1970s. After a few years of buying, selling, and comparing, it became clear that these hundreds of bully were from the same archive that dated to the end of the 7th century BC, beginning of the 6th, right during Jeremiah's life as a prophet. This time period is characterized by its ending, the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon in 586 BC. The seals in this archive belonged mostly to high-ranking court officials. The clay was fired unevenly by an ancient fiery destruction. These factors led many to deduce that the archive was originally in Jerusalem itself, or at least in an important administrative city. Then the archive would have been destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC. Some of the important royal officials represented by these clay impressions are the governor of the city, probably Jerusalem, Adonayahu, the overseer of the house, who is the highest official next to the king, and various servants of the king, which actually mean high-ranking officers. There are three seals represented that stand out as extraordinary. The first one may have belonged to a man from the Bible's pages. That man? is Elishama. In Jeremiah 36, he attempted to help Jeremiah escape the king's wrath. The Bible calls him a scribe, but this bulla only has the title servant of the king. The second seal we can conclusively state was the seal of a man featured in the Bible, King Jehoiakim's son Jeharamiel, who was sent to arrest Jeremiah and Baruch. The final seal identified is the most amazing, the seal of Baruch, scribe, friend of Jeremiah, and the original copier of the book of Jeremiah. What's really interesting about the book of Jeremiah is that there are many personal sections spread throughout this book. And, and uh, we're told that Baruch, as Jeremiah's scribe, wrote this book not only once, but as we progress through the book of Jeremiah, we realize and read that Baruch actually had to write the whole thing again, all the prophecies down again, because it was ripped up by one of the kings of Judah, piece by precious piece, because these uh, not only would Baruch have 
have written this, handwritten the entire book of Jeremiah, but he also would have been responsible for preparing the vellum, the animal skin on which uh, this was written. Uh, and that was not an easy job. It took a really long time. So I always feel very sympathetic for Baruch knowing the process that ancient scribes had to go through. But uh, the human element of the book of Jeremiah is really interesting, especially when placed up against the political and social background of the time period of Jeremiah. I mean, these people are being threatened uh, by the empire of Babylon. They're fighting against the empire of Babylon. And Jeremiah's message from God is don't fight. This is of me. You have lost your right to survive as a nation right now. Your hope will come later, but this process is a process of consequence that you have to go through. Now, who likes being told that they're wrong or that they're worshiping God wrong? No one, but that was part of Jeremiah's message. Change in the very nature of things may indicate that God has abandoned us. And Jeremiah 16 explains that our success does not dictate the way something is. It is God who gives success in those places and when he's accepted. When we bring God into the atmosphere, we gain the blessings from the Lord. And many today have forgotten this and they abhor the God of the Bible. I mean, in the United States of America, we remove God from every possible public situation and reduce public prayer to one of prayer in thought only. In Canada, we've not moved as fast, but we've done the same thing. We've moved God out. And it's the same in the United Kingdom. And it's the same in Australia. And it's the same in New Zealand. There is great wisdom and understanding that God is the reason we receive blessings and favor. Jeremiah 16, verses 1 through 9. The word of the Lord also came to me, saying, You shall not take a wife, nor shall you have sons or daughters in this place. For thus says the Lord concerning the sons and daughters who are born in this place, and concerning their mothers who bore them, and their fathers who begot them in this land. They shall die gruesome deaths. They shall not be lamented, nor shall they be buried, but they shall be like refuse on the face of the earth. They shall be consumed by the sword and by famine, and their corpses shall be meat for the birds of heaven and for the beasts of the earth. For thus says the Lord, Do not enter the house of mourning, nor go to lament or bemoan them. For I have taken away my peace from this people, says the Lord, loving kindness and mercies. Both the great and the small shall die in this land. They shall not be buried, neither shall men lament for them, cut themselves, nor make themselves bald for them. Nor shall men break bread in mourning for them, to comfort them for the dead. Nor shall men give them the cup of consolation to drink for their father or their mother. Also you shall not go into the house of feasting to sit with them to eat and drink. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will cause to cease from this place before your eyes and in your days the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. Jeremiah chapter 16, verses 1 through 9. Jeremiah chapter 16 is amazing. And I want to tell you something, as we read it, as we understand it, Janice has just read it for you, that you need to realize that it is the prophet of God, Jeremiah, who is communicating the words of God and the inspiration of God. Now, the prophet, Jeremiah, is full of the Holy Spirit. 
And he is not a person who is the kind of person who, who uh, gets full of the Holy Spirit by all positive things. I mean, Jeremiah is, a, is an intense prophet. We have more written about the personal life of Jeremiah than any other of the prophets. It is amazing. And so it's important for us to stop, beloved, and to read and to listen. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And as we look at this, he speaks to you today. He speaks to me today. And so our review is simple. Wisdom in success. What does that mean? Our reading is Jeremiah chapter 16 to 18. If you read that, you will keep up with us in the Bible as we go through the Bible in one year. That's very important. And then focus on Jeremiah chapter 16, verses 1 through 9. And there are four points here in this guide, four points from this, and many more uh, different uh, ideas here that we want to present to you. When you write with an offering in any amount, we'll send it to you, and you can only get them through Quick Study Television. But as we look at this, we see verse 16, or chapter 16, verse 1. It says, the word of the Lord also came to me, saying... You shall not take a wife, nor shall you have sons or daughters in this place. For thus says the Lord concerning the sons and the daughters who are born in this place and concerning their mothers who bore them and their fathers who begot them in this land. They shall dig gruesome deaths or die gruesome deaths. They shall not be lamented, nor shall they be buried, but they shall be like refuse on the face of the earth. They shall be consumed by the sword, by famine, and their corpses shall fall and shall be meat for the birds of heaven and for the beast of the earth. Now, God is serious when he says this. He speaks. God says that our future is threatened because we turned away from him. We must turn back. We have an opportunity, beloved. Here he says to ancient Jerusalem, he says, stop, listen to me. It's, it's, you're, it's gonna die, it, it's go, it, you, you're gonna expire. Listen, turn back to me now. And you know, the Lord says that to us today in all of our activities of elections and all of our activities, stop. Don't look at the economy, don't look at this, don't look at that. Listen to God. If you're a Christian, if you're somebody who believes in Jesus Christ, listen to what the Lord would say to you, beloved, because God is speaking very clearly. And whatever we vote, however we do it, the Lord speaks to us how to vote and how to do it. It's very important because we're going to give account for what we did with everything we do. We must turn back to God and allow God to heal us, beloved. So important, so important. Well, we go on to verse 5. This is chapter 16, verse 5. It says, For thus says the Lord, Do not enter the house of mourning, nor go to lament or bemoan them, for I have taken away my peace from this people, says the Lord, loving kindness and mercies. Now, what's he saying here? He's saying God says that peace is taken from the people because they ignore him. We must not ignore God, beloved. We must pay attention to the Lord. How important this is that ancient Israel ignored God. And they said, well, we got the temple. We're okay. We've got all of that. But God said, no, it, that's not it. You don't understand. You must seek me, not the temple, not the items, not the idols. Seek me, the Lord, your living God. And beloved, today, that's what we need to do. We don't need to seek this person or that person or this saint or that saint or objects on the wall. Or any. We need to seek the living God, Jesus Christ, the living Lord. And we need to say, Lord Jesus Christ, I've sinned and I'm sorry and I forgive me and help me to get straightened out and turn away from evil from the world and focus on you and, and take my job at work and all of that and turn me into what you're doing, oh God. That's what we need to do. In the UK, in Australia, New Zealand, everywhere this program is presented in English where you can hear it, that's what we need to do. And it's important for Canada and the United States as well. And so I, I submit to you today, come back to Jesus, know who he is and pay attention to what he's saying. Well, six through eight says, both the great and the small shall die in this land. They shall not be buried. Neither shall men lament for them cut themselves, nor make themselves bald for them. 
nor shall men break bread mourning for them to comfort them for the dead, nor shall men give them the cup of consolation to drink for their father or their mother. Look at verse eight. Also, you shall not go into the house of feasting to sit with them to eat and drink. How important is this? And the best thing I can say is God says that life will be meaningless and lost if we continue to ignore him. If we continue to ignore him, we must come back to God through Jesus Christ. We must come back to the living Lord Jesus Christ and say, God, forgive me of my sin. Help me today. And I want to serve you. And those of you who know God, we must say, Lord, I've got to get into the Bible. I've got to read the word. I've got to know what you're saying. And so I just a little bit every day, maybe not everything, not, you know what they say, but I'll take a little bit every day and I'll read just a little bit every day. Get back to the word of God. Get back to seeing him. Get back to saying, yes, Lord, I am yours. And that is so important. You know, when I get to heaven, I want to be able to say something to the Lord. <laughs> you know, I'm going to say, well, Lord, you know, uh, I, I did everything. I read every word, every word that you put in the Bible. I read every word. I didn't understand every word, but I read it several times. And may we think about that. May we do that today, beloved. ancient city that was located in the southern kingdom of Judah that is a very interesting one in terms of its past history, but also its supposed future history. You'll see what I mean. Let's take a look at Megiddo. The ancient city of Megiddo strategically sits in the Jezreel Valley that runs right across the land of Israel, connecting the Mediterranean Sea in the west to the Jordan River in the east, a giant natural highway. It also intersects with several north-south trade routes, so whoever controls Megiddo can exert widespread power over the trade and warfare of the land. Famously, Pharaoh of Egypt, Tutmos III, said that capturing Megiddo was as good as capturing 1,000 cities. From all the levels of destruction at the city, it's clear that many other leaders felt the same way. In fact, the reason Megiddo is such a large hill today is due to the city being destroyed and rebuilt so many times. The newer levels were built right on top of the destroyed layers. From what archaeologists can reconstruct, Megiddo was under Egyptian control until some point during the biblical time period of the Judges. By the time King Solomon came to the throne, Megiddo was one of his building projects. He fortified the city's walls and installed one of his famous six-chambered gates. After the kingdom of Israel split under Solomon's son Rehoboam, the fate of Megiddo was to be conquered and reconquered by nations vying for control. But there is one incident that stands out, the death of King Josiah. The once dominant nation of Assyria was struggling to hold off the growing power of Babylon. Egypt was marching up through Judah to help Assyria. But Josiah decided to stand in the way. At Megiddo, Josiah was killed in battle. He was the last king in the line of David who rose to the throne without foreign invention, and he lost his life here. Biblical prophecy says that one day the Messiah will win another battle here and usher back the days of David's throne. Four blood moons, what are they? Do they hold any prophetic significance as some claim? Or are they some sort of harbinger to signal the end of the world as we know it? Or are these the cosmic signs prophesied about in the Bible more than 2,000 years ago? Or is this just another repeat of Y2K or 2012? 
Join Ryan Henry as he seeks to answer these questions and uncover the truth behind these cosmic events in this full-length Cosmic Mysteries special. To order your copy of the Cosmic Mysteries Blood Moon special, simply send a gift of $25 or more to Quick Study Television. If you live in the United States of America, write to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150, or call at 724-733-8336. If you live in Canada or anywhere else in the world, write to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2, or call us at 519-940-8338. Don't delay, get your copy today. Thank you for staying with us and being a part of this program as we go through the Bible in one year from Genesis to Revelation. Now, next time on Quick Study Television, I am excited because we're going to talk about this. As a matter of fact, God says he knows. He knows the evil shepherds and will punish them for their work. And we'll talk about that and more coming up next time on Quick Study Television. But right now, here's Ryan with Cosmic Mysteries. Ryan? The Bible says in Jeremiah 33, 22, that the stars are uncountable. Now, this was not always believed by scientists. However, when telescopes were turned towards the heavens, it was suddenly realized that this statement in the Bible was absolutely correct. But the question is this, how do astronomers possibly keep track of all these stars as well as the other celestial objects out there? I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. These words of God to Abraham compare the number of his future descendants to the stars in the heavens and to the sand on the shores, which are both uncountable according to Jeremiah 33:22. Although it is common knowledge today that the stars are innumerable, this was not always believed. Second century Alexandrian astronomer Claudius Ptolemy cataloged 1,022 stars in his book, The Almagest. And while he did not claim that he had cataloged all the stars, many believed that he had. As astronomers turned the telescopes towards the heavens, however, it was soon realized just how countless the stars are. Astronomers now estimate that our Milky Way galaxy alone holds over 100 billion stars. It is also now believed that there are more galaxies in the visible universe than there are stars in our own. With so many celestial objects in the universe, how can astronomers possibly catalog them all? One way is by using the constellations. A constellation is an identifiable group of fixed stars, and 88 of them have now been defined. How astronomers use these constellations to help them can be illustrated by a map of the United States of America. On the map are 50 states which are all clearly defined by their state lines. The constellations are the same way. Just as each state has an exact part of land well defined by its lines, the constellations also have an exact part of the sky that is well defined. And just as constellations can be compared to the state lines, celestial objects within a constellation can be compared to the cities within a state. For example, the Andromeda Galaxy is found within the Andromeda Constellation. So really, its full name is the Great Galaxy in Andromeda. Stars are also given names similarly. The brightest star in the constellation is usually given the Greek letter Alpha, followed by a slightly modified name of its constellation. For example, in the constellation Centaur, its brightest star is named Alpha Centauri. The next brightest star would take the next letter in the Greek alphabet, Beta, and so on. There are also a couple of other cataloging systems for celestial objects that are not based off of the constellations. One is the New General Catalog, or NGC, published by Cambridge University. In this catalog, which is frequently updated, the Andromeda Galaxy is journal entry number 224, so it is called NGC 224. Another popular catalog was developed by a French astronomer named Charles Messier, and is called the Messier Catalog. The Andromeda Galaxy is entry number 31 in this catalog, so it is called Messier 31, or M31 for short.
You know, it's really humbling when we look towards the heavens with all of our advanced technology and still cannot see the end of it all. You know, I like how President Abraham Lincoln put it. He said this, I can see how it might be possible for a man to look down upon the earth and be an atheist, but I cannot conceive how he could look up into the heavens and say there is no God. Fascinating mm -hmm. stuff. Very good, Ryan. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll see you next week for another one of those good friends or one of those uh, cosmic mysteries things here yes. on Quick Study. What did you study today? Well, I took a look at Jeremiah chapter 16 for a little bit closer look at Jeremiah the man. Now, many have called Jeremiah the weeping prophet and for good reason. Here we learn a little bit more about Jeremiah. In verse 2, we learn that Jeremiah is commanded by God not to marry or to have children. And this is because the future judgment that will be coming. Now, this was a very unusual command, especially for an Israelite. In verse 5, we learn that Jeremiah mustn't go to a funeral feast or even to mourn for the dead. He also, in verse 8, was not to go to any type of feast or festival. Jeremiah really became, Rod, a social outcast. He became the lifestyle and the message of God to Judah. Fascinating. He was actually rejected in many yes, ways. Yes, he was. I mean, his culture, I mean, who he was... Uh, with the people. He, he really was, had to separate yeah. himself and, and, from and the he culture. was the opposite of what they wanted and to And his believe. message was so hard. <laughs> it, it's true. This is really interesting as you begin to study it and mm -hmm. understand the book of Jeremiah and the reason we love Jeremiah so much. I mean, this is the weeping prophet, but he's the prophet that we know so much about and also the personal pain of. Mm. This is good. Well, here is Call to Prayer. God is ready to show himself to those who truly want to know him. But there are times when humanity does not seem to want to know the Lord. It is remarkable and heartbreaking that there are people who live and die without knowing God. However, the Bible shows us that this has happened and will continue to happen. When we pray for the lost, we must pray that the blinders are removed from their eyes to enable them to see God the God of the universe, and how he very much loves them. The Lord Jesus Christ is amazing. God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God in three persons. And as we look at this, we need to understand that all of us have sinned. The entire world has sinned. And I'll tell you something, you can see that sin when you look at the news all around us. I'll tell you that much. But Jesus Christ came and gave his life and he rose again in the flesh so that you could have freedom from sin. Pray and say, Lord, become my Lord. I need you today. Help me today, Jesus Christ.